Let's jump into the word today. Uh, open your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter four. If you missed the beginning of the service, my name's Chris O'Peel. I'm one of the pastors at Frontline. Great to have you if you're visiting, if you've been invited today. Uh, we're gonna experience a radical uh, passage, really. It, we're gonna read it and I'm gonna say, what just happened? Um, because today's title is called Reconcile. Reconcile. David uh, prayed about conflict, which is what we're learning today, because reconcile means to resolve conflict, to work things out, to bring into agreement, to win over to friendship in a way that restores to people or groups, to a peaceful, unoffended relationship. Reconcile. To restore unity. Where the wrongs have been righted, where the two no longer hold a wrong against the other. And this word reconcile assumes that there are broken relationships in your life and in my life. Because if there's one thing we know, when we're born, we know how to fight. We, we know from the very youngest age how to break relationships. Somehow, we don't have to learn this. We come in to this world ready to somehow learn that in order to control the situation, all we have to do is make our body go limp. And, you know, we can't, uh, you know, our parents now have to figure out a new way of moving us to where we don't want to go, right? No one has to teach us that. Like, just sit down and yell at the top of your lungs. No one teaches us that. We're really good at breaking relationships. In fact, we're so good at this, we have a whole category of ways how to make things worse. We call it revenge. We call it giving what was coming to them. We call it going off. We publish a video as we cue it our job in a rude way. We make an innocent Facebook update that starts with, can I just say, no, just don't say that, all right? Like, just keep that to yourself. It's not helpful. We have an incredible way of making things worse by bringing it back up and talking about it with others. What we're not good at is restoration, reconciliation, coming back together, restoring unity. We're not good at that. Making up, setting things right, agreeing, call it whatever you want. We're not good at repairing relationships. Otherwise, the divorce rate wouldn't be more than 50%. Not just outside the church, but inside the church, guys. On top of that, Christians have a way of being known for stirring up conflict. We have a reputation of standing for what we are against, of shaming, not restoring, of ostracizing, not helping. Christians have a reputation for stubbornness in conflict because we think we are right. In fact, some Christians make their living off of YouTube channels focused on calling out all the false teachers, like all of them. You ever, you know, pop up a YouTube video and your favorite preacher's name is there saying false teacher. You're like, what? You automatically watch it, right? Like, I need to know, is my person teaching me wrong? Look, there's something inside of us that we want so much to be right more than we want to be loving. Mm, come on. And Jesus said that we should be known for our love. Instead, we're known for the conflicts we stand for. There's a big difference between rightness and righteousness. Yeah. And the difference is love, the context, the manner of how you go about it. You see, we follow the most right being in the universe, the Holy One, the Most High God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave up his right to be right and took on himself all the wrongness of the world because he loved us so much. And so if there is something we should be good at as people who are called by Christ's name, it should be reconciling. It should be restoring relationship. We should be a place 
that people outside the church flock to, to say, we cannot get this right. Would you please help us? Oh, how I wish the church were a place like that. Now, before we dive in up front, there are some conflicts that we cannot resolve. And if you've been uh, tracking with us through the summer, if you're just jumping in, we're, we're in a series called Mind Games through the book of Philippians. And Paul has already referenced several types of relationships that you will not be able to reconcile. People who were persecuting the church, people he called dogs teaching a false gospel. And in chapter three, he says, these people are doomed for destruction. They are enemies of the cross of Christ. So there's some conflicts that we will need to stand our ground in. Those persecuting, oppressing you, those conflicts where we must fight to protect the innocent, to restore justice, to affirm the value of all people. These are conflicts that are complex and lengthy and difficult. In every situation, as we talk through conflict today, every situation has a set of complexities. Nothing is simple in conflict. Everything comes, in fact, with baggage, as, just as each individual comes with a history of how they dealt with this stuff in the past. But Scripture gives us guidelines, and Scripture gives us hope through the gospel, guys. Hope through the gospel about how we can reconcile. And so we're going to play a mind game today to transform our lives and how we experience conflict, how we follow the Lord to reconcile. Chapter 4 of Philippians, verse two. I'm gonna read the, the four verses and then we're gonna walk through them together. Think about this happening as this letter is read in the church that it was sent to, okay? The, this would have been read out loud as the church gathered. Hey, guys, we got a letter from the Apostle Paul and we hit this section. Verse two. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my coworkers who na whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Now, I think he keeps going in this section, but we don't have time. We, kind of part two of this will come next week as we talk about anxiety and worry and how we deal with that in, the, in our minds. But, but do you realize what just happened here? Paul just put people on blast. Like, what if today you walked in and before we started singing, I said, hey guys, we need to do something totally different before we start today. Like, okay, Gloria, could you, could you come down here? And, and Bertha, you're on the, you guys are on opposite sides of the auditorium. Could you come up front, please? And uh, you're gonna have to agree in the Lord. And you, could you come up here? You're gonna help them. Your way of worshiping today is to resolve this conflict. In fact, I reserved 105. You're going to go over there. We're going to worship. You guys get your worship on in there. <laughs> what just happened, guys? Like, this is being publicly read to the church. How would you feel if you were Yodia and Syntyche? How would you feel if you were invited for the first time to church that day? <laughs> What did I get myself into? And if you're here for the first time, I, I've never had to do that, okay? <laughs> I might have wanted to. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding about that. Guys, this is incredible. And how do you think they felt when Paul switched gears and said, rejoice in the Lord always? What? I'm totally offended right now, Paul, that you just called me out and you want me to be happy? No way. This is a mind game. So we're going to start at the beginning, verse two, with a thought to rehearse this week. If we're going to renew our minds, we need to rehearse certain thoughts over and over and over again so that we make these pathways in our brains to think the right way, to think truth, because it transforms us. The thought to rehearse to start with is unresolved conflict spreads like cancer. 
Unresolved conflict spreads like cancer, guys. Can we just start with the fact that Paul is addressing these two women by name from 800 miles away. Paul is in Rome, Italy. Yodia and Syntyche are in Philippi in a city, Northeast Greece. And they had no Facebook. They had no social media, guys. No telephone, no email, no video chat. Yet this conflict has made its way 800 miles west. This conflict was killing these ladies. This conflict was killing the church in Philippi. It's spreading. And you know that that's true about conflict. You know that. Let's just take something simple. You're on your way to school, you're on your way to work, and you have a, a little discussion with a family member, right? You get into conflict before you even get there. And so you're walking into work or you're walking into school with, you know, you got your poker face on because you're still rehearsing the zinger that you really wish you had thought of 20 minutes ago. And somebody is, is happy to be at work and they're like, hey, what's up? And you're just looking off into the distance, hey. And you know what that person's now doing? Oh, what, what did I do wrong today? And then they get over here and they say, hey, what's wrong with that guy today? And now, now, oh yeah, you know him. If he gets off, he just wrecks the whole day for us as a, as a department. What just happened, y'all? Spread like cancer. Spread like cancer. It leaks out of us. It leaks out of us. We can't help it. We, we, we might even think that we're getting this right, but, but I'm bothered. You know, whenever I'm dealing with a conflict that's not going to just automatically get dealt with, man, I bring that home. Or I bring it with me to work. Or bring it on Sunday morning. I bring that home. I, you know... If, if there's a place in my life that feels out of control, do you know what I do in other parts of my life? I try to control it all the more. My kids, I, sometimes I try to control them because there's something else in my life that's out of control. Conflict spreads whether or not we think we're all over it. It just leaks out of us. It might just be a sarcastic aside about the competency of someone with whom you disagree. It might undermine, you know, just, just a slight comment that undermines your, the, someone's trust in the leadership. It can come out as hurt and negativity, destroying the mood. Conflict spreads. L- look at this verse in Hebrews. Look at this verse. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. Like bring people to, bring people to Jesus and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile what? Many. Not just you, but if there's bitterness, if there's, if there's an ongoing conflict, an anger, a foothold of anger in your life, that thing's gonna be leaking out, defiling many. It's like, it's like taking a toy out of mud and putting it in sparkling water. Do you wanna drink that water anymore? No, it defiles. It just kind of leaks out of us. Unresolved conflict spreads like cancer and it's killing us. It's killing us. It costs us so much time, energy, and finances to leave conflict unresolved. And so what are we gonna do? We're going to do something repeatedly. We're gonna pra- we have a practice to repeat. Here it is. Prepare your heart, then your speech. Prepare your heart, then your speech. See, so often what we do is we start with uh, thinking about how we're going to respond before the other person is even finished with what they're saying. No, we need to reverse that and say, okay, I need to hear it. I need to prepare my heart and then prepare my speech. Don't just speak either. You still need to prepare your speech, but you need to prepare it from the right heart. You need to prepare it from the right heart. Look at what Paul is saying. He knows this. Look at verse two again. He says, I plead with Yodia. 
And I plead with Syntyche. He doesn't just say, hey, I plead with you both. He says that word twice in the Greek. I'm pleading with you. And he could say, I command you to work this out. But he doesn't say that. He says, guys, I love you. This is killing you. I'm pleading with you. Would you please resolve this conflict? Please. You're not being effective at work. You're not being effective in ministry. You're not being effective in your families. The church international is being dragged down by this reconcile. Where? Where do they need to do this? To be in, of the same mind in the Lord. To be of the same mind in the Lord. That, the, the phrase, of the same mind, some, some translations say agree in the Lord, but that the, the words, the same mind in Greek, the, the place that we see that, the only other place in the Bible is in Philippians chapter two, verses, verse two. It says this. We, we, we saw this a couple months ago. Paul says, make my joy complete by having the same mind being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. And as these women are hearing this, I think because this was an oral culture, they would have been thinking, oh, I've heard this phrase before. What was Paul saying? Could you read that letter, that part of the letter again? What's the next verse? Verse three, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility, value others above yourselves. Consider others more significant than yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. As these ladies are hearing this, they're thinking back to those verses. Oh, as I'm trying to deal with this, I need to not be thinking of my own interests. I need to be thinking of what's best for them. I need to consider them more significant than myself. That takes serious heart work and Paul doesn't just say, do that. He, he helps us back in chapter four, verse three. Look at what he says. Hey guys, your names are written in the book of life. You did ministry with me. Do you remember the good times when you worked hard together? You knew you loved Jesus. And remember, you both have salvation. Like if, if you're in conflict with someone who is also in Christ, remember that they are going to be with you forever. You might not want to hear that, but you need to recognize that your names might be written right next to each other in the book of life. And if they're saved, they have the Holy Spirit, which means God can be speaking to them and God could be speaking through them to you. So as this conflict is happening, you have this incredible opportunity to say, what I am hearing from this person, I might need to receive as me being wrong. And what is happening in them may be from the Lord. As much as I don't want to admit that, this could be the way the Holy Spirit is leading them. Now, it's, I'm grateful that the Holy Spirit's also in me in this, and I can be discerning what's happening in me and being, coming, coming to this scripture and saying, okay, is there any ambition in me right now? Is there any selfishness and conceit in seeing myself better than I actually am? And as we're submitting ourselves to the Holy Spirit, and letting him convict us about our sin, about what is right in this specific conflict, we can walk together in love through his power, not our own. We need to prepare our hearts. What does preparing our hearts look like? Let me give you a tip about me. If you come to me and you have something hard to say, like Chris, you, you offended me, uh, and I get super duper quiet, you know what's happening? Inside, I am wrestling with my heart. Like if, if I am poker face and you can't read me, there's trouble in here. 
And, and I am right in that moment trying to wrestle my heart to the ground, examine myself for pride, examine myself for what is right, as well as examining your words and saying, are what, is what you're saying theologically true? Is what you're saying uh, fair that I've mistreated you or that I've, I've, I've been out of place in this? I'm wrestling with my heart and I'm keeping my lips closed because I know myself too well that if I open my lips, I will not build you up. I will tear you down. We need to prepare our heart. Because in my brain, I'm thinking, there's anger, my heart is beating fast. There, that person goes again, only caring about themselves. No, I can't think like that. Right? We do this. Now, Paul goes on into verse four, again, still trying to prepare our hearts, saying, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Rejoice. How in the world can I rejoice in the middle of this awful conflict when you're taking shots at me, when my reputation has been ruined, when there's gossip floating out there, there's narratives out there that, that I have no control over, when I feel like the, the truth has been misrepresented? How can I rejoice in this? Uh, one of the books that I was reading this week is my third time through this book, uh, just once this week, but it has this passage in it and he says, how do we rejoice? How do we rejoice? Well, it's in the Lord. It's in the Lord. In fact, let me, let me just point this out to you real quick before we, I read the, what he's doing here. It says, verse two, guys, be of the same mind in the Lord. Verse four, rejoice in the Lord. That in the Lord is the same. I think what Paul's doing here is saying, hey, to be of the same mind, you gotta get on the same page in rejoicing in the Lord. Here's what this guy says, this looks like. He says, oh Lord, you're so amazingly good to me. You sent your only son to die for my sins. I'm in the Lord. Including the sins I have already committed in this conflict. Thank you. Because of Jesus, I am forgiven and my name is written in the book of life. Thank you, Jesus. You did not treat me as I deserve, but you are patient and kind and gentle and forgiving with me. Please help me to do the same to others. In your great mercy, you're also being kind to my opponent. Although they have wronged me repeatedly, you hold out your forgiveness to him as you do to me. Even if he and I never reconcile in this life, which I still hope we will. You have already done the work to reconcile us forever in heaven. This conflict is so insignificant compared to the wonderful hope we have in you. And then he goes on to rejoice for three more paragraphs with the Lord. I'm not gonna read them. Uh, by the way, this is called The Peacemaker by Ken Sandy, an incredible book about conflict, uh, offense, resolving that. Guys, he's saying, where do we find our joy in what is absolutely true forever? Rejoice in the Lord. I'm saved. I'm forgiven. Everything that I'm going through right now, it's not gonna matter for eternity. What matters most right now is that I can be made, uh, that, that my faith in Christ could be made known through love, through reconciling, through restoration. That is the witness. Jesus says everyone else will be able to say uh, the gospel is true. And so we say, okay, Rejoice must be a choice as much as it is something that happens to us. This is not just be happy about horrific things that are happening to you. This is rejoice, be, be joyful that you, you are secure because of the gospel of Christ. You're choosing to say, my reality is more secure and strong by faith than what I see. This is a mind game. Now, let me also point out, you cannot hold offense and rejoice in the Lord at the same time. Come on. Like you can't be mad at someone and still be saying, wow, God, thanks so much for, being, for forgiving me so much. You can't do that at the same time. That's impossible. You see, not only did God choose to overlook how offensive you are to him, he bore the cost of repairing the damage. He paid your debt. He took the punishment by sending his son. 
came with his blood for every sin, mistake, and difficulty that you've caused in someone else's life and in your own life. And so as as we're preparing our hearts, we're saying, Lord, help me to see my salvation and my forgiveness more clearly than this offense that's, that's right here in front of me. God, would you help me to experience your forgiveness in such a way that it softens my heart to be ready to forgive this other person? In other words, just saying, another pastor said, Lord, help me rejoice in you in this moment because I know you are in control. I know you love me. You love my family. And though I don't understand what you're doing and I don't know how things are gonna work out, I do know I have you. And that means I have everything. Now last, as you prepare your speech, I said prepare your heart, then your speech, Paul gives us some advice in verse five of chapter four. Verse five says this, let your gentleness be evident to all. Yodia Sintaiki, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. I'm gonna explain what that means. It doesn't mean just closeness. But let your gentleness, what, it, what is that word gentleness mean? It doesn't just mean, you know, uh, to have a soft touch. The best Greek dictionary describes this word like this. The meaning is not insisting on your every right by the letter of the law or custom. Not insisting on your rights based on the law or custom. You can translate it as yielding, gentle, kind, courteous, or tolerant. I'd add unoffendable. Because if you're giving up your rights, you're giving up the the right to have your expectations dashed or your identity offended. It's coming back to Philippians chapter two. Let there be no selfish ambition, no vain conceit. This is hard for us. But guys, you can can give up your rights for the sake of relationship. That's hard to do. But you can give up your right to be right. You can give up your right to the money. You can give up your right to defend yourself. You can give up your right to demonstrate how wrong that person is. You can give up your right to your reputation. You can give up your right to the promotion. You can give up your right to be served. You can give up your right to be treated politely. You can give up your right to be comfortable. You can give up your right to be safe. You can give up your right to privilege. You can give up your right to fill in the blank. You can do this because we have the Lord who gave up his rights. Chapter two, verse six, the climax of the book. We gotta go back there every single week that Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, something to behold on. He gave up his privilege To do what? To take the form of a servant. To do what? To become your sin. To do what? To be punished. Death on the cross for you and me. This is our Savior. And Paul says the Lord is near. What he's meaning by that is not just that he's he's right next to you, which he is. This is a reference in the New Testament to the Lord is coming back. The Lord is coming back. And do you know what happens when he comes back? He makes every wrong right again. He reestablishes justice. So if you were wronged, he's going to make it right for you. You don't have to fight for your rights. You can let him come and fight for you. He can reestablish justice and wholeness and peace and health for you. This, the Lord is near. We take comfort in that. He can take revenge. He can restore If you want to be satisfied, wait for the Lord. If you want to be justified, wait for the Lord. If you want your reputation to be restored, wait for the Lord. It will all become clear. How beautiful is that? What a beautiful promise that is. And you don't have to fight for the things that you you find so valuable. This transforms our minds. 
And so I, just a four-step process. How do I deal with conflict? Because now we're at that speech part. We've prepared our hearts. We see the gospel. We see the Lord coming. How do we prepare our speech? Because Paul's saying here, hey, you guys got to work this out. Well, here's, here's how we start. The goal is restoration. There's a slide for this. Just the, just the, good, four steps. The goal is restoration. The first step is not even to take a conflict back to somebody, but it's to first say, can I overlook this? Can I just give up my right? Can I just give up my right like the Lord? Can I just allow this to pass? And can I say as Christians, 80% of our conflicts should just finish right here. I can overlook this. I can forgive and move on and rejoice in the Lord. Step two, though, is keep going to the person alone. Look at what Paul says in verse two is, Yodia, Syntyche, get together. Get together. Go to the person alone. This should end alone. That is how we stop it from spreading. We go with gentleness. Proverbs 15, one, a gentle answer turns away wrath. How's your anger working for you? It's not. And then if we find that we cannot solve this by going alone, Matthew 18, 16 says we invite help. Verse three says we invite help. And so we have a second practice to repeat today. This is not something I give you to give you permission to go start more conflicts, okay? But this is something that we need to embrace as something that we can do. Practice to repeat, don't mind your own business, help resolve conflicts. When there's a conflict that is killing two people and you see it happening, don't mind your own business. Look at what Paul's doing. Verse, verse two, he's saying, guys, get together. He's not minding his own business. And then verse three, look at what he says. I ask you, my true companion, we don't know who that is, but he calls somebody out in the congregation and says, you gotta help these women. I don't know why you guys aren't helping them. Help. Matthew 18, 16. After you've tried to deal with this conflict alone, if they will not listen, Jesus says, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now, we don't jump to that step right after we just bring up the conflict, okay? Like, you, you, you don't get points uh, if you just say, hey, uh, this happened, and then they, they have a bad reaction. Like, you, you have to go several times, okay, until you realize this is not gonna help. Then you go together. Now, how do you know when it's time to get involved? Because I just gave you permission. It's biblical to get involved, to not mind your own business. My answer is we get involved dependent on several questions. How serious is the division? How long has it been going on? How mature are the people involved? Okay. All right. How close is your relationship with them? Who else is already involved? If you can answer those questions in a way that makes you feel like the Holy Spirit is pressing on you to be a reconciler, to be a peacemaker, then you step in. But you prepare your heart first and then your speech so that you're able to walk in gentleness and help two people or help two groups work it out. How serious is the division? How long has it been going on? How mature are the people involved? How close is your relationship with them? And who else is involved? As we answer those questions, the closer you are, the better. The fewer people engaged, the better. The longer the amount of time, the more you need to be involved. But tread lightly. Read Galatians 6, 1 through 5. It says, rebuke one another if you're caught in a sin, but then the next four verses are all about how you don't get involved. 
Last year, uh, I was reminded about a situation that I had to step into. Uh, six, seven years ago, went to, my wife and I, were, we were living in China. We went back to the States to do some fundraising for our ministry. And uh, while visiting a friend, I observed that person uh, be extremely rude to their, to their dad. Just, just words that dishonored him in front of me. And I'm really close to this friend and, and I enjoy this friend so much. Uh, and I didn't want to have to bring this up because I didn't want to wreck that time. I, we were only there for a short time. We wanted to have beautiful fellowship. But I knew that this was not going to be a good situation if they didn't work it out with their dad. And, and so I brought it up a little bit fearfully. I prepared my heart first. I said, God, help me because I don't want to do this. I said, hey, that didn't go well. And they said, well, what, what, what do you think needed to happen there? And I said, well, I, I think you, you definitely owe an apology. Your dad was looking out for you. And they got made really angry with me. <laughs> it kind of ruined that time right there. But last year, they, they reached out to me and said, Chris, I, I've been thinking about that ever since. And, and I reconciled with my dad. I, I went and I apologized and but I always think, man, I'm really grateful that you stepped in. Guys, we are never more like Jesus than we are paying, than we are when we are paying other people's debts. You are never more like Jesus than when you are paying for others' debts. Debts meaning offenses, things that need to be forgiven. You see, our Lord and Savior and I've alluded to it throughout this message, took sin. He who had no sin became sin, your sin and my sin, so that our offenses could be struck down by the Lord our God. Romans 5, verse 10. While we were God's enemies, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. He paid our debt, the debt we all owe but could never pay ourselves. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 and 19, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. How beautiful it is when we are paying for others' debts and what a testimony that is for the world. I read an incredible story this week. A guy invited his friend to church. And before the service got started, the pastor got on stage, called an elder up, and said in front of the congregation, last week, me and this elder got into a conflict during our Bible study hour before service. And we said things that should not be said in front of you. And I just want you to know that after church, we got together, we worked it out, we apologized to each other, and we're, we're fully reconciled. And the elder then said, yeah, and, and, and uh, uh, followed that up basically the same message. And the, the guy who invited his friend was there squirming in his seat saying, oh man, <laughs> why did I invite you on this Sunday? Took that person out to lunch. Here's what they said. I still can't believe what your pastor did this morning. I've never seen a minister do something like that. Could I come back next week? And within a month, that person received Christ as their savior. <laughs> Guys, what if we were a community that restored relationships, not, not just restored, but became known for restoring relationships? Because Christ, our savior, restores relationships, paid our debts. Would we become a community like our Lord, known for paying for others' debts? And along the way, we would just get such glimpses of Jesus that would make us fall more deeply in love with him and more deeply in love 
with one another. We need to pray and respond this morning because some of us have conflicts that we brought with us today. And there's something that God wants us to do with that. 